Good morning. You know, whenever you uh, hear a sermon on giving, especially when you're talking about giving money, um, I think a lot of people assume that, that there's a problem. <laughs> you know, it's not something that is always very comfortable. Money topics are not very comfortable. So I want to assure you as we enter into this study um, that there is not a problem, uh, that uh, everything is good at this congregation has been exceptionally generous um, to the work of the Lord. And I commend you for that. I, I know that we do many great works, such as Athens. Um, this congregation has heavily supported that work and, and done a wonderful job with that. And the money has been available uh, to help Benny and Sunila and do that work there. And of course, now we have Brad and Rebecca's work, uh, you know, doing their online Bible um, uh, courses the, the through the Sunset School of Preaching, and that's a great work. So this congregation has been exceptionally uh, generous. So this is not in any way um, a cry for help or a rebuke or anything of that nature, but um, it's a good opportunity for us to take the time and learn, be educated, be edified, and be encouraged by the words of the Bible when it comes to the truth about uh, giving. Unfortunately, and maybe you've had this experience too. I know that I have certainly seen it um, in my ministry and places where we have lived that money, especially money given from the congregation for the work of the Lord, has become an incredibly divisive topic for churches um, across the country. Um, instead of being a blessing, that, that suddenly becomes a curse for a lot of people, and people get really um, frustrated by that idea. So hopefully this series of lessons will be, or this lesson particularly, will be an encouragement to you. And so I want to tell you where we're going with this from the very beginning. This, this is the main point of the lesson, and I, and I hope that this, this short little phrase will be helpful for you. Um, but giving is less about duty and more about gratuity. I purposely made those rhyme because I'm hoping that that will uh, uh, stick with you, that it's less about duty and more about gratuity. And what I mean by that is, is that it's something that we do voluntarily uh, beyond obligation, and it is motivated by the generosity of Christ. And so that's where we're going with this lesson uh, this morning. So to establish our baseline and kind of get some background for what we're going to be talking about, I want to go to Acts chapter 11 and establish a problem where the brethren need funds. They need help. They need somebody to come in and help them. This can be established from Acts chapter 11. So let's go ahead and read that, if you will, from verse 27. It says, Now at, the same, at this time some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, one of them named Agabus, and he stood up and he began to uh, indicate by the Spirit that there would certainly be a great famine over all the world. And this took place in the reign of Claudius. And in the uh, proportion that any, uh, excuse me, and in the proportion that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. And as they did, uh, sending it in charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders. So there's a, a, a known problem here that there's going to be this great famine. famine. And Luke says it took place uh, during the, the reign of Claudius and the brethren were hurting. There was some struggles. And so all the, the rest of the groups, the congregations of different areas that were being established, they're going to chip in and they're going to help out to bring relief to the congregation in, in Judea to help them have some support. Now that brings us, the context brings us to this point here. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. And this is what Paul's talking about. He's talking to the church in Corinth. He's encouraging them to get involved in this, uh, participate in this work. And look what he says. He says, now about the collection of the Lord's people, do what I told you, told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, right, that's when we gather together in the first the convenient time, obviously, uh, since we're together. Each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with their income, saving it up, so that when I come, no collection will have to be made. Uh, just out of convenience, this is being a step. Paul is saying, you guys are going to, you need to participate in this. This is how it's going to work. Here are, here are some uh, some examples of how we can do this. 
first day of every week, y'all meet. That's a good time to give those funds. As the week goes on, set aside some money so that whenever I come and you have that collection ready for me, uh, I can take it with me and it won't be an issue. I won't have to sit here and go from house to house. I wouldn't have to to, uh, stand up and try to solicit funds for the work. It's going to be ready for me when I come. We'll be able to take it to Judea. It'll be a gift from you to them for relief. Uh, But when we get to 2 Corinthians, that's where the problem comes in. A lot of issues that happen between 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. Um, There are some people who come along and are stirring up trouble in Corinth. There's disunity that starts to to fester and distrust in Paul. And so they're they're stirring up some uh, dissension and, and trying to put them against Paul. And Paul is having to defend himself, something he doesn't really like to do, but he has to do it. And he has to defend his um, apostolic authority because his work is so incredibly important. And what we find out is the brethren stopped putting money aside. And they had stopped setting aside money because they didn't trust the situation. They didn't trust Paul. They didn't trust what he was doing and, and what he was doing with the funds. And so there's certainly a problem that comes up. But Paul doesn't see this as a money issue at all. And that's really important. He's not looking at this and saying, you know, you guys need to step up your game. God demands you to give money. God forces you. This is your duty. This is your responsibility. You need to get on the, on the, the, uh, the wagon and, and let's go with this thing. You know, other churches are doing it. You have to do it too. But what Paul is really seeing here is that this is a, a heart issue. That their lack of contribution, their stopping of contributing is a reflection of their heart. It is saying something about the relationship to God. It is saying something about their understanding of God's generosity to them that is actually being revealed through their lack of contribution in this situation. Their unwillingness to help and their distrust is coming from the heart. And not necessarily coming from a mathematical situation. So let's go ahead and look at that. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Now Paul spends a lot of time, chapters 8 and chapters 9, talking about this. We're only going to touch on this one section here. Uh, We may pick up some more later on, but this is what we're going to do for now. So starting in verse 1 and 3, it says this. Now brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God, which has been given to the Macedonia, that in... A great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy, their deep poverty, overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord. And so Paul is is looking at these churches of Macedonia, and he's making this point to this probably very wealthy church of Corinth. And he's saying, those folks, they're in deep poverty. They're suffering affliction. They've got some problems. There's a lot of things going on. They have, in other words, you would say, they have every reason to have a good excuse not to give. But instead of taking that excuse and using it, they turn around and they go beyond that. And, and it, it is it is amazing to see this group of Christians so wanting to give that even in the midst of a, an extreme difficulty, they're still willing to do what they can. <laughs> you know? And Paul's impressed by this. But he's going to talk about it in, in light of not because they felt like they had to, not because they were forced to, not because Paul made them do it, but it's because their heart is so committed to God's people, to God, to Christ, to the gift of grace that has been given to them, that they are overflowing with gratitude. And it shows in in what they're willing to do with their stuff, what they're willing to do with their funds, that they desire to help. It's a reflection of who they are. In fact, he presents it as the manifestation of God's grace. The manifestation of God's grace. Now, this doesn't necessarily refer to salvation in the moment, although it's it's connected to salvation, but it's the idea that what they're doing is, is, um, is something that God approves of. It is a, a manifestation of, 
the, the gift of God, it, it is so rich and deep in meaning that it, it would be, take us a while to really unpack the idea. So hopefully we, we can do that a little bit as we continue on. But it is working, God working through their generosity, resulting in an amount given that is beyond expectation. It is God working through their willingness and their generous hearts and their love for the brethren that is going to amount in an impressive contribution that even Paul himself is impressed with. So let's keep looking on this on these verses. Look at verse 4. He says, the, the, these are the, the churches of Macedonia begging us with much urging for the favor. And that same, that word favor is that word that we would sometimes translate grace. For the favor of participation and the support of the saints. And this not, not as we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. And so the idea is that they gave beyond. But Paul says this first. He says, but here's what came first. <laughs> this is what came first. They gave themselves first. They gave themselves to the Lord first. And they gave themselves to the apostles and that's important in Paul's argument because, remember, there are some who are trying to put the church against the apostles and say that Paul's, you know, keeping some of the money and there's some dishonesty there and don't trust Paul. And, and Paul is saying these people have shown trust. They have shown commitment not only in the Lord but in the Lord's workers and the Lord's people, that the apostles are being honored, Christ, the, the Lord is being honored, that work is being done, and, and that's what came first. Their giving of themselves overflowed with their giving of funds to the work of, of the church, to the collection of the saints. Their generosity is an overflow of them giving themselves to the Lord first. Now, we often make giving just a command, you know, I mean, uh, growing up, that's all I've, I've really thought about when I thought about contributions of any kind. It was just a command. You know, they would say, well, are, are you a Christian? Well, then you have to give. Well, if you don't give, you know, you're sinning, and that's not good. And it just, it just became a command in my mind, like I, an obligation, like you have to do it, you have to do it, you have to do it. And, and you know, even if, even if you don't want to, you have to do it. And, and so it becomes a mathematical equation to some degree. Um, that we, we just think about, well, how much do I need to give and how much do I, do I have to give? Well, when we start asking those questions, you know, how much do I have to give? You know, what's the bare minimum? <laughs> what's the limitations of this? You know, in other words, where, where's the bottom line where I can satisfy God? You know, just to say, okay, is it, is it somewhere in the 10% range? Because that's the way it was with the Jews. So if I gave 10%, will that satisfy God? Does that make God happy? You know, it's almost just trying to appease God with what we give. But what Paul is presenting here is not that at all. He is saying, no, no, you don't understand. When you give yourself to the Lord and you recognize the gift that he is giving back to you, and, and you just automatically overflow with gratitude for God's graciousness, that it suddenly, those numbers are irrelevant. That doesn't matter anymore. That, that 10%, you know, 15%, 20%, you know, who cares? Because you're not giving from necessity, but you're giving from the heart. You know, it stops being duty. Well, I got to do it every week. But it suddenly becomes gratuity. You're doing it out of a great appreciation for what God has done for you. And when, when there, the desire stops, right? When you kind of say, well, I don't really want to do it anymore. Then, then we have to stop and evaluate our relationship to God. I mean, is my commitment to God waning? Is there something wrong? If my desire is missing, maybe something else is missing as well. Look at verse 6. He says in verse 6, So we urged Titus as he had previously made a beginning, so he would also complete in you this gracious work as well. Now, we don't really know what exactly that means, um, that Titus previously made a beginning. There's, it's very debatable, but it's possible that Titus was involved in the first request, that when we read 1 Corinthians and we see uh, Paul's writings to the Corinthian church, that Titus was kind of involved in that, and 
and that was the beginning that Paul is referring to, we don't know. Um, it's not really clear. Uh, but the main meaning is very clear. It's the very fact that Paul says, what you started doing before, and then you stopped. And Paul knows why they stopped, okay? You know, there's distrust, there's difficulty, there's struggles in the church. Um, and Paul sees this as a reflection of that, and they stopped. And what Paul is encouraging them to do is, is, is get back to it. But I want you to think about this for a moment. Paul is just not saying to them, hey, you need to start giving again. You need to start opening your wallets. You need to start moving some money around. You need to start giving. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is you need to get back to commitment to God. You need to commit yourself to the work that we are doing through you as apostles who have authority over you based on the authority given to us by Jesus that, that you need to become more committed and more faithful to the work, that you need to be united in your work and the contribution that they're being encouraged to give is going to reflect that. It's almost like when Paul starts seeing the funds coming from Corinth, he's going to start thinking, yes, this is good. This means that they are recommitting themselves to the work. This means that they're recommitting themselves to the word and the work of Jesus through the apostles. He sees it as a reflection of their heart and not necessarily an act of duty. In, in regards to their relationship to God. Look at verse 7. He says, But just as you abound in everything, in, in faith and utterance and knowledge, in, in all earnestness, in the love we inspired in you, see that you abound in this gracious work also. See, see the hope is that they are encouraged to participate beyond expectation. That it's going to become something that is a part of them. That it's going to be a joyful occasion that they're going to see helping their brothers and sisters who are struggling in Judah to be an awesome thing for them. It's going to be a powerful experience for them. Look at verse 8. He says, I'm not speaking this as a command, right? He says, I'm not commanding you to do this, but as proving through the earnestness of their sincerity of your love also. That word proving sometimes is translated test, to test the sincerity of their love, to test whether they, they truly love God, whether they truly love the brethren. To, it's kind of a way of saying, you know, if you, if you really have feelings for somebody, you're going to respond in a certain way. And Paul sees that as this is the response. You know, Paul is testing them in a sense. Where are you in your relationship to the brotherhood? Now, the Old Covenant tithe is no longer in effect anymore. That was something under the Old Covenant. It doesn't, it doesn't, uh, um, is not bound on Christians today, but that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that Christians don't give, right? As we read through the Bible, all through the book of Acts, what do we see? We see constantly, over and over and over again, the brethren collecting funds, selling property, doing whatever it took to take care of each other to make sure everybody's needs were met, to be united in those gifts and make sure all the families associated as they're coming into the body of Christ are being cared for and fed and clothed and all the means taken care of. That, that's how the church worked. And so suddenly that, that tithe, which was so important to the Jewish people, which really became kind of a, um, an act of duty for them, now it has been transferred to the Christian faith in the sense that, yes, we continue to give, but our giving is out of an extreme gratitude from what God has done for us and an extreme love for God and the brethren and a desire to take care of the people of God. There's a phrase that we sometimes use, and I'm sure you've heard it before. You put your money where you're what? Your mouth is, right? We, you know, well, if you're going to say it, you, you know, the funds need to start coming, right? You know, it, but for Christians, we, have, we should have another phrase. We don't really have it, but maybe we should adopt it, that we should put our money where our heart is. Have you heard that before? Okay, so put your money where your heart is. So where your heart is, guess what? That's where your money's going to go. How easy, easy is it to spend money on something that you enjoy? Anybody feel that's easy? You know, I mean, it's really awesome. We're, we're like, yes, this is so good. I can't wait to do this. And we're excited. 
And we're like, well, I'll, I'll pay twice that. I just can't wait to have it or do this or participate in that because that's where our heart is in the moment. And we're willing to contribute our funds to a lot of different things because that's where our heart is in the moment. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying that it's a reflection of something, right? If you see a guy that's got a whole bunch of boats in his front yard, what do you think, where do you think his heart is? He really likes doing whatever he's going to do with boats, whether it's fishing or whether it's it just, uh, you know, sporting activities. And like I said, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a reflection of where his heart is. And so what does that say about a group of people who are taking care of each other and providing for each other and clothing each other and feeding each other and providing for works like in Athens and in Lubbock? And what does that say about a person when you see their funds going that direction? That's where their heart is. And that's very true. Where our heart is is often where our money goes. And so we just need to be mindful that sometimes we need to think about where's my money going? And is it a reflection of where my heart is? And that's an important aspect of what Paul is trying to communicate to the brethren here in, um, in, Col- in uh, the Corinthian churches. Macedonia is obviously a great example, but look at verse 9. He says this, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that through though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. That's the idea of Jesus' humility and coming to this earth and and becoming man, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich, right? So the bar is suddenly being set even higher. He starts off with the Macedonian churches, and he says, look at these guys. They're afflicted, they're in poverty, they're hurting, but they gave so much. And it's such a beautiful thing because it reflects their heart, and it shows how much they love the brethren, and it shows how grateful they are for the salvation they have in Jesus. But then let's raise the bar even higher. (laughs) Let's look at Jesus. What did he do? Well, he had everything, and he gave it all up for you, right? So the bar suddenly gets raised even higher in regards to our gratitude and our giving. Look at verse 10. He says, I give my opinion on this matter, (laughs) okay? Paul's good about that. I give my opinion on this matter, for this is to your advantage who were the first to begin a year ago, not only to do this, remember they started, but they stopped, but also to desire to do it, but now finish doing it also, so that just as there was the readiness to desire it, so there may be also the completion of it by your ability. Now, the NIV says in one phrase, and here is my advice about what is best for you in this matter. What's best for you? Okay? Yeah, then again, it's not just a matter of, of duty. It's not a matter of a command. It's not a matter of do this or else. It's a matter of this is good for you. This is beneficial to you. And let me help you. Let me give you my opinion on this matter. Let me educate you and encourage you to participate because it's actually good for you. That giving doesn't just benefit the recipient but it also benefits the giver. That it's a mutual relationship where we find benefit from from taking a part of of what we have collected. You know, we work so hard and we try to build it up and we we look at it and we say, oh yeah, look how much money I have in my bank account. You know, it it becomes a source of pride and it suddenly becomes a source of self-sufficiency. You ever thought about that? That when we can just make enough money and build enough, you know, build as many silos as we possibly can to collect all the grain. Remember, Jesus uses that illustration that we keep harvesting and it just keeps bigger and bigger and bigger. And we think the more I have, the more protection I have. The more I have, the safer I am. The more I have, the better things will be. But that's not always the case. Because a lot of times, the more a person has, suddenly the more responsibility they have, the more responsibility, the more stress, the more they're fearing of losing it, and it just suddenly becomes this vicious cycle, and it becomes very ugly. Now, granted, some people can manage that very well. Some people can do a great job with a lot. Some people, on the other hand, not so good. (laughs) It can be very divisive. It can be very destructive to a lot of people. But the point is, there has to be the desire first. The desire comes first, and from that, we see the contribution. 
for this work. That's what Paul is saying. You know, first there's a desire. Once that desire is there, I don't even have to ask you anymore, right? The rest of it's just going to come. Once the desire is there and the need is known, there's no need for me to even command you to do anything. There's no pressure. There's no reason for me to ask. There's no reason for me to hound you about it. Hey, guys, where's that money? Where's that money? Because if the desire is there, naturally from the desire flows the means. Whatever the church needs, the church will take care of its own people. How many here like to pay taxes? Anybody? Nobody likes to pay taxes? Oh, come on. It's fun, isn't it? I mean, we're closing to April 15th, getting pretty close. Surely we have to pay some taxes, right? So you have no desire to pay taxes. Is that right? Why do you pay your taxes? Why do you pay your taxes? You don't want to go to jail? I mean, you have to, right? I mean, it, it, it's an obligation, now, nobody wants to write that check, but we're obligated to write the check, right? We're called to do that. I mean, that, that's something that if we don't do, there's going to be punishment involved. Unfortunately, us giving our means for the work of the Lord can easily become a religious tax. It's something that we feel like we have to do, but we don't really want to do it. Oh, I'll write the check, but I don't really want to. I'd rather spend this money on something else, but if I don't, I guess God's not going to be happy with me. And that's how we see it. And it's very unfortunate because what are we doing? We're robbing ourselves of the joy that comes from generosity. That we're robbing ourselves of the joy. Now, I've never had joy paying taxes, right? But we can certainly have joy in giving to the work of the Lord. And we can experience that joy, but we're not going to experience that joy if we see it as a religious tax. And we're not going to enjoy it. So what, is, what comes first? Paul says the desire comes first. Once the desire is there, then the rest is going to come along with it. And it's going to be a benefit for you as well as it's going to be a benefit for them as well. Look at verse 12. He says, for if the readiness is present, he says, it is acceptable according to what a person has not according to what he does not have, all right? And, and so the idea is that if the desire is there, the heart is in the right place, there's, a, there's a, a known need, and the members are anxious to give and contribute to that work and do what needs to be done, whatever is given is enough, right? Because it comes from the heart, you know? And, and I think we've got this idea sometimes that we think it's all about like a, we all have to have an equal amount, you know? I mean, that's what it is. I mean, well, they have more than me. They should give everything, and I don't have to give anything at all. And that's not the way it works, is it? Right? I mean, because it doesn't matter where you are. Whether you have a little or whether you have a lot, whatever you give is enough. If the desire is there, granted. If the desire is there, whatever is given is enough for the work of the Lord. So it's not about being governed by some kind of law, Right? It's not a law. It's not a law of tithe. It's not a law of 10%. It's not a law of 20%. It's not a law that says, you know, as soon as you walk in this door, you better put some money in the plate or else you're going to be sinning against God. It's not the law, but it's the heart that is establishing the desire to contribute, and that's enough. That's all that God asks of us. Look at verse 13. He says, For this is not for the ease of others and for your affliction, but by way of equality. Now, let me kind of explain that a little bit. The NIV says this, our desire is not that others might re be relieved while we're hard pressed. You know, it's not as if we just take of our um, means and we say, well, we have plenty of money, but we're going to give, you know, 95 percent of it to the hurting church. And then all of a sudden they've got an abundance of funds and we're hurting. Paul is saying, no, that's not it. It's not the way it works. You know, that's not how the church functions. We're going to have all different groups of people. We're going to have some with a lot and some with a little, and, and that's okay. We, whatever you give from that desire is going to be enough. You know, it's the idea that if I, if I had $2 and you had $1, you know, equality might say this. If you thought about that word in English, it might say this. You might say, well, if, if you had two <laughs> and I only have one, that means you need to get rid of one so we can both have one. Or you need to find a way for me to have two so we can both have two. That's not the way it works. There will always be those who have less and those who have more. 
And guess what? The ones who have more can obviously afford to contribute more without hurting their family. And those who have less, well, they're not going to be able to do that, right? That's not that kind of equality. We have to do what we can within our means and still take care of our families and protect them and their needs first. Look at verse 14. Oh, excuse me, verse 14. He said, at this present time, your abundance being a supply for their needs. So you guys, he's talking about the church in Corinth. You all are doing really well. Church in Corinth is doing well. They're hurting. But your abundance is going to supply their need. So that their abundance also may come become a supply for your need, that there may be equality. So that's what Paul means by that. He's saying, at the moment, right now, they're in need and you're doing good. So what does that say? Well, that says that you take from your abundance and you give some to them to help them. And someday those roles might be reversed. Someday you may be hurting. And that congregation over there is going to take from their abundance and they're going to help you. It's going to be a mutual equality, unity, relationship that helps one another through difficult times so that we can get through these things together. Look at verse 15. As it is written, he who gathered much did not have too much. That's what Paul says. And he who gathered little, guess what? They had no lack. Right? And, and that quotation comes from Exodus 16. I think the context helps understand what Paul's talking about here. But in Exodus 16, verse 18, it says, When they measured it with an omer, he who had gathered much had no excess. He who had gathered little had no lack. Now, this is an important phrase. Every man gathered as much as he should eat, right? There's a sense in which we recognize the needs of others. And and we recognize that we all go through difficult times. Sometimes we feel like we we have an abundance. And then we look, we don't take that abundance as a sense of security and say, well, I've got an abundance. I'm going to hoard all that I have so I can just keep it over here just in case I have a problem, you know? And then we have a brother or sister who's over here suffering, you know, they, they don't have means, they don't have clothes, they don't have food, they don't have shelter, but we're over here hoarding all of ours and saying, yeah, but tomorrow it may all be gone. So I'm going to keep it over here. I'm not going to help my brother and sister over there because I need to take care of myself. And, and that seems to be the way Corinth is right now. They're at a good place. This other congregation is hurting. And Paul says, don't. Don't just keep your abundance to yourself, but participate in the gift of gratitude. Participate in the gift of giving. Rejoice with them. As they receive your gift, it's going to build them up and uplift them, unify you together as you help one another in the body of Christ to become one. So Paul sees the church, and and here's where we're going to kind of conclude with this. Paul sees the church as the means of God's divine fulfillment to ensure that his people have all that they need. We don't expect manna to come from heaven. We don't expect quail. We don't expect our clothes to never wear out. But what we do expect is that any and every congregation, that the brothers and sisters here that are part of this group, that you will never go hungry, that you will never go without clothes, that you will never go without a home, because the brothers and sisters here are going to give out of their abundance to make sure that never happens. We will take care of one another. And we recognize that as God's fulfillment of a promise to ensure that we will never be without as we provide for one another. And we should expect our brothers and sisters to do that, right? To to clothe us when we need clothes, to feed us when we need food, to house us when we need housing, that we look out for each other and take care of one another. The joy of giving. (laughs) It's more than just a duty, It is indeed about gratuity. We give out of our desire because of the gift that we have received. If there's anybody here this morning who maybe you have some struggles or some difficulties and you have some needs, please let those needs be known. Or or maybe you're just struggling with other things and you need prayers. We're here to pray for you. But whatever your need may be, maybe you have a desire this morning to become part of the Lord's church and put Jesus on baptism, to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. We're available for you. Whatever your needs may be, if you would please come forward as we stand and as we sing.